Welcome to Governance Now. This is Gitanjali Minhas and you're watching Checks and Balances. The booming Indian aviation industry is the fastest growing sector in the world and projected to be valued at $40 billion by 2027. However, despite this robust demand for air travel across the country, more than 50 airlines have closed down due to problems. Most private airlines have closed within the first five years of operation. Aviation is a highly capital-intensive sector. It requires deep pockets and profitability, besides good management practices. Running an airline comes with very high fixed cost and a high variable cost. Fixed cost is in terms of lease charges or towards repayment of loans taken for purchase of the aircraft. Now, whether you fly the aircraft or not, you continue to incur these fixed charges, besides variable costs like fuel, oil, and maintenance. Some of the stark examples of class airlines shutting down operations in the recent past are Kingfisher Airlines, Jet Air, and most recently Go Air. Earlier airlines like Paramount Airways, Bayadut, NEPC, East West Airlines, Air Orisa, Air Costa, and so many others have shut operations. The list of failed airlines is getting longer. With aviation experts in this episode of Checks and Balances, we discuss structural issues plaguing airlines in India. For the benefit of our viewers, ATF stands for Aviation Turbine Fuel, MRO stands for Maintenance, Repair and Overall, OEM means Original Equipment Manufacturer and DGCA means Director General Civil Aviation, CS Subaya, former CEO Alliance Air and Executive Director Air India, explains ATF constitutes about 33 to 40%, depending on the airline and how they are operating. Except for airlines which are operating smaller ATR aircrafts, highly fuel efficient, you will find that ATF pricing in India is still out of the GST per week, which has been causing a lot of concern for the airlines. If you remember, it was right something around $20, today it's around $85 the barrel. This is just going up like anything and there is no way small airlines can hedge the bet. It has to come in the GST. Even there is going to be a 5% difference in the pricing which could give the airlines a huge benefit. This is going to be one of the most important points which the new government it should have on its 100 point agenda uh, for the, 100, the first 100 days which will help in mitigating the cost structure of an airline. The second the most important cost of an airline is uh, engineering or evolving MRO. In India, there are 500 aircrafts. There are three components in an aircraft, major maintenances. Engine, fuselage or the, or the landing gears. The other one is the AP, auxiliary power unit. These are some of the major components which we cannot service in India except for few series of engines. Most of the time, the major maintenance or the major checks, airlines do take it abroad. First is the foreign exchange. Second is the most importantly, it, it takes a lot of time. In the airline industry, the parlance, we use something called downtime of an aircraft. Some airlines have gone down because of large overheads due to COVID, mostly due to MRO issues where the downtime has killed the airline. And we are looking at an industry which is growing, which is trying to grow exponentially in the coming years. The government has taken a lot of steps to bring in the MROs into India, especially the now present government. The major players like Safran or CFM or who is involved in this, they haven't come into the country to establish an MRO facility with all the equipment so that the engines or the whatever it is can be repaired here. And also, this according to the new government, it's like making India, it should be like service in India. We have a thousand aircraft order coming in. That means this problem will become a huge one in the coming five to seven years. As the airline has brings in more fleet, it needs more revenue, but at the same time, the aircraft are also going to be on cyclical maintenance. Now, the, all the components which you need today, they don't come from India. They are being cycled from abroad. That is a huge cost. To set up an inventory in India costs billions of rupees. It is a major problem faced by all the new airlines which are coming. Kaushik Khona, former CEO of Go Airlines, while explaining reasons for failure of Kingfisher Airlines, Jet Air, as well as Go Airlines, also says that. Biggest issue is that the two OEMs 
the aircraft manufacturers who are predominantly manufacturing the aero bodies the airbus and boeing actually supply almost 80 to 85 percent of the aircraft inventory required for a normal passenger movement across the world I and mean, it's not just india in india they provide almost 95 percent except for small atrs and and uh, other aircraft which we exclude 95 percent of the aircraft which we want or with the world wants let's say 80 to 85 percent of the world inventory is provided by only two OEMs. Now, this is a global monopoly. They are aware that the entire world depends on them. That any new aircraft manufactured to come into existence or to be credible enough will take another 10 years minimum. They are aware that nobody can defeat them. There have been many reports where Boeing uh, aircraft have been failing. Again, engine manufacturer, which are also majorly two. One is we have CFM and second is we have Pratt & Whitney. Third is obviously Rolls-Royce, but their capacity is very small. Now, the entire world is being supplied on an average 1300 to 1500 aircraft in a year. And there are only two aircraft manufacturers, there are only two engine manufacturers. Perhaps they made a kind of shortcuts to achieve more production than the quality. The situation is that we are left with nothing. We are also charged custom duty for the items which are our own and which we have just sent for free repairs where we are actually going to the OEM. Now that amount itself in a year for all the aviation, uh, all the airlines in a year is around 1500 crore. The biggest problem which Go first had was again the Pratt & Whitney engine. The OEM on which we relied the maximum made us suffer for the last three years and in spite of the fact that we were trying to find out some solution and in spite of the fact that we were not at fault, the SEAC also gave an emergency arbitration award in our favor. Pratt & Whitney knew the problems that they were deep in their own uh, environment and they didn't want to recognize that problem otherwise they would have to honor to all the airlines uh, customer. They had almost 67 airline customers. They have agreed. But that is after we have gone into the CIRP. The situation today is that almost, I would say, 200 aircraft of Pratt & Whitney engine-powered aircraft are grounded. Maybe on a sequence. They will be grounded till 2026. Go ahead had three years of aircraft grounded of an average of 37% of the fleet. Imagine a situation where you have aircraft where you are paying a substantial amount of lease rent per month and they keep on grounded. It is only because I think we are relying on few OEMs to supply the inventory for us. Let's go to 2012 where Kingfisher had to fold up. <laughs> One of the main reasons was that it got engines which were failing and that was V2500 engines where almost 25 to 30 percent of, it, of its fleet was grounded and the another reason is a corollary is they absorbed the LCC part by taking over Deccan Airways uh, and uh, that is where I think the biggest problem started. The line of demarcation which Kingfisher had was that it was a premier airline yeah. supposed to premier services and therefore the cost structure of the airline was obviously high and when you are trying to dilute your own brand by bringing an LCC into your fold, you are going to get fares of LCC but you have to spend for a full service career. I think that is a, one of the biggest issue where they diluted their brand, they diluted their fares without understanding the cost structure. Grounded aircraft was a bigger issue which Again, uh, V2500 is again a Pratt & Whitney engine and we all are aware about what is happening right now. Jet was the best airline and I think it also suffered the same problems as Kingfisher. Jet also did what the mistake perhaps the Kingfisher did. Jet absorbed uh, Sahara, then gave two brands, more brands. One is Jan Sahara became Jet Light, which was an LCC airline. And if that was not enough, Jet itself created one more subset called Jet Connect. So within Jet Airways, they had a full service carrier and they had a, 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 the LCC. One of the major issue which Jet and Kingfisher, in spite of the fact that they are a good brand, failed was that they did not recognize their own values and they tried to devalue themselves by comparing with the LCC. Apart from the fact the OEM um, engine failure also which affected both 
in fact the jet also was affected by boeing and uh, kingfisher was also affected by the pratt and whitney v2507 engines and that is where the entire uh, structure crumbled when we have seen all these uh, airlines going down i don't find any report which says that the funds were diverted if you look at fisher i have not seen any report from the government that there were diversion of funds or any any airline which which went bankrupt yes there could be a possibility of a not a proper business model Pankaj Srivastava, former director, commercial and board member, Air India, he says, In India, we are heading towards a very strong duopoly market. On the one hand, we have strong Indigo airline, which controls almost 57 to 60 percent market share. And on the other hand, we have Air India and its subsidiary companies, which controls about 20 to 25 percent market share. So in case of the 80-85% market share is taken away by two carriers, then uh, the rest of the carriers uh, become actually uh, very small players in the Now because of geopolitical situation, there have been sanctions imposed on certain countries. Mm. And because of sanctions, the supply for manufacturing of those engines or components has stopped, which has resulted in a uh, you know, delayed delivery of aircraft orders. On the one hand, when the market is increasing rapidly, airlines had made provisions to utilize that increased opportunities by ordering more aircraft. But because the delivery system has delayed, uh, you are missing that opportunity. With almost uh, 1000 plus aircrafts coming in, out of which almost 20% will be for replacement of aircrafts. The remaining 80% will be of additional aircrafts. Now, do we have the infrastructure? The answer is no. There are many small airports coming in, but they are not capable of handling the bigger A320s or 737s. They are capable of handling ATRs, smaller aircrafts. Now, under that circumstances, where are they going to be parked? Where are they going to operate? If they be parked on one place, they have to operate profitably on some routes. That means that there will be a dead lick for the airline. That's going to cost money. Fundamentally, this is going to create a lot of issues for the airline. And I'm not sure, except for Navi Mumbai and the new airport at Delhi, any other new airports coming up in a big way. We have so congestion issues. Yeah. So the busy airports doesn't have any more slots, either for landing or for parking. And the demand is actually from that side. There's fragmented airspace in India. There are multiple air traffic controls in India. So this all leads into suboptimal utilization of airspace in the in India. The industry lacks trained workforce in terms of pilots, engineers, technicians, and needs to ramp up these resources along with cabin crew, ground staff, have more training institutes and academies which have not kept pace with growth in civil aviation. When management lacks discipline, it compromises training and safety in airline operations. The most important part in aviation is training. Not just the training, but the safety aspect of it. Especially when your pilots are going for training, there are so many checks and balances. Now, does India have the necessary number of pilots? Do they have the examiners? Do they have the trainers? The answer is no. Again, imagine, with 1,000 aircrafts coming in, you need close to 8,000 pilots. Where are they going to come? I know that Tata's are setting up a huge training academy with my good friend Baskaran heading as a CEO, but it will take some time for them to establish the simulators. Lack of capital structure in an airline causes major problems. Costing has to be done effectively, which includes governance, and governance comes down largely from the board. Profitable and operationally stable airlines with good financial power have the wherewithal to get experts on board and hold them accountable to deliver results. It is a business with long haul. You need to have good balance sheet and funds at disposal. Most of the time, boards which are, these companies are not publicly limited. They are privately held. So the board is full of people whom they are well known. A lot of things go under the car. The major thing under the governance, which I feel is a major issue, is the safety part. So governance and safety go together. Financial prudence will cut down any sort of safety issues. And also financial prudence is the part of the governance wherein you will never make these mistakes. It is not good enough to start an airline with some money. As we grow the airline, you need to have sufficient funds infused time and again 
so that the CEO or the CFO or the head of engineering doesn't have this sort of a problem that I don't have funds, how do I run it? So then all this cutting the corners happen. And unfortunately, DTC is not present or the regulators are not present everywhere. DGCA, the regulatory authority under the Ministry of Civil Aviation, proactively ensures that technical snags reported across the world do not occur here. However, it is headed by a bureaucrat and not a technocrat. Aviation experts said that DGCA needs to bring in more technically proficient managers to head divisions and engineers to hold surprise checks and inspections of all aircrafts. It needs to be much more independent and autonomous and have more technically proficient people with it. Speaking of congestion at Mumbai airport, with huge delays in flight takeoffs and landings have been causing inconvenience to air travelers and upsetting the schedules. As an example, if an aircraft is hovering in the sky for 45 minutes waiting to land, it is consuming 2,000 kilograms of fuel. And if it is hovering for one hour, it is consuming 2,500 kilograms of fuel. This cost is ultimately passed on to the consumer as part of the operation cost. We are still burning fossil fuel, means uh, carbon emissions. European Union has come up very strongly and they have set norms which would be followed by all the airlines using European airspace. And in case if they don't follow that particular norm, then there are heavy penalties imposed on the airlines. R.K. Srivastava, former Indian Administrative Service Officer and former Chairperson of Airport Authority of India, while explaining reasons for congestion at Mumbai Airport, he says that Mumbai Airport has a, a unique problem of uh, many constants are there. It was not uh, that fortunate enough to have got the land in place when they started. Um, it is a financial capital, so there is a huge, huge demand from across the different part of the place and it is unable to make that much supply. So that is the gap between the demand and supply. You have the limited space, is uh, located in a very densely populated uh, area. The land availability is only about 2,000 acres, you can say roughly. Now they are going to develop airport in the size of, I think, 3,000 acres. That is in the Raigad district. Many advantages which the Delhi or other metros have Bombay is uh, suffering from those uh, problems and therefore they don't have place to develop the number of uh, runway required to meet that demand. Being the financial capital, it, every city wants to get connected with Bombay. Every airline, they want to start operations, connect the other destination of this country with the hope up with that uh, gap of the demand and supply. And third, of course, is the infrastructure challenge because of the lack of the availability of the land. There are two runways, but they are cross diagonally. So you can't run, do the simultaneous operations. There should be a minimum space required between the two runway if you want to have the simultaneous operations. And therefore, at a time, only one runway is operational. And mostly it is the main runway is the runway number 27. Rated capacity is only 46 in P covers, 23 for departure, 23 for arrivals in case of 1 1 scenario. But despite this, many of the times this airport authority, particularly those who are into the controlling the airspace and managing the takeoff and arrival and departure at a time, in a in an hour, they have even crossed sometimes the Petwick uh, airport of the London. All the departures and all the arrivals can't be accommodated in a given time frame. This is the major delay during peak hours particularly. And, and they have the problem of sometimes weather, sometimes no time is given, some maintenance is required. Sometimes between in the midst of nights, they have to shut the operations to do certain uh, things to make it um, operational for next now. In the week, I think for in half an hour, some closure is given, done by the airport to make it operational for. 
Average delay of the estimated is about 16-7 minutes, but sometimes maximum you can say in the region is between 21 to 23 minutes. That is the maximum delay which has been estimated. Departure delays are very difficult to determine as the T set and generated by ACDM, that is the coordination and done by the airport authorities, is not regarded. So, of late, the government of India disturbed in because they found that there is an airlines, they were not uh, following the time slots given to them. Sometimes the operators, they were allowing the non schedule operation during the peak up. So that was also causing the delay. Second problem is cutthroat um, competition, airline business. And to win the faith of the customers, the airlines are increasing the block timing to have arrived before time, which leads to discrepancies and allocating the slots. One of the reasons for the delay to the departure is the prime time slot allocations for the departure. Once the Navi Mumbai airport becomes operational, a lot of these issues will be addressed because you are developing in a larger chunk of the land. You will properly plan the two runways so that there is a enough space between the two runways. The length of the runway is also increased. The cargo capacity will increase. Your movement will increase. It will get connected with rest of the And it, will, it is coming with a lot of other connectivity and infrastructure which will make seamless operation for the computer. And if they follow the regulation issued by the government of India that airlines, they have to work in tandems. The airlines operator has also to understand that just to capture the bigger market, bigger share in the aviation industries, you can't go beyond the capacity which this kind of the airport allows. Despite the constraints, is it still possible to optimize the resources? Yes, how? Using Joe Airport for uh, turboprops can be used, can be thought of. Where the smaller aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, which does not require that longer runway, can be moved to a uh, new airport. I think in times to come, probably one may have to actually start working on it. Now with AI, I feel you can do wonders in flight safety. It can go into the data and you can come with good ideas because optimization tool is one of the major things in an airline, especially in scheduling and all. And at the same time, it can also warn you about the safety issues that can crop up there. So the, there is technology coming in. Airlines have to adapt faster, except for the chatbot in uh, the websites. I have not seen AI being used anywhere in the airline. It can be used in aviation, not in the aircraft perhaps, but in the ground. It can do a lot more wonders. Your attention please, Indian Airlines announces the departure of their flight. Passengers are requested to proceed to the aircraft. With the kind of population we have in the country, at the moment we have just about 2-3% to of our population who are using civil aviation. But if this 2-3% to has to grow to 5% or 6%, you can imagine what's the size of the market we are talking about and what kind of infrastructure investments we require in the country. The Indian aviation market is growing leaps and bounds. With the kind of investments which are coming in now, things would improve substantially in times to come. Passengers can look forward to get a uh, much better flying experience in future. At least for six major airports in the country, they provide world-class services already. Thank you for watching Checks and Balances. See you on the other side.